Very pleasant good evening to all. I hope you have a Bible with you that you'll be opening to the book of Micah and finding Micah the sixth chapter where we shall begin our reading of our text tonight. Have you ever felt that sometimes our justice system, as good as it is, has certainly failed on some occasions? Sometimes it seems that those who may have enough money can hire a lawyer that will get them off when it seems evident they're guilty. Maybe you might think of the case O.J. Simpson as an example. Or maybe sometimes it works the other way, that those who really are poor cannot seemingly get justice to help them get off when otherwise they seem to be found guilty. How many times are we hearing of late where some have even spent 20 years or so in prison, only later to find with modern DNA testing they really were not guilty to start with. It's an imperfect system, isn't it? Or, or maybe sometimes even in our generation, have you ever felt that there are some preachers, at least who claim to be preachers of the Word of God, who have made godliness a way of gain, who live in mansions, and when really evidence is made public, they have made out as though people are giving to the Lord when in effect they're lining their pockets instead. If you've ever felt that there are those who claim to be servants of God but are hypocrites in reality, and if you've ever felt that our justice system is sometimes awry, then you can feel as though you live in the time that Micah lived. Micah was a prophet of the Lord that spoke at a time shortly after the northern kingdom or during the time of the fall of the northern kingdom. You would sort of date him about 735 B.C. and Samaria fell in 722. But Micah was a younger contemporary of Isaiah and really spoke primarily to the southern tribe of Judah. Perhaps when we look at Micah, we really probably maybe sometimes think of him as the one who, who prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5 and verse 2, in fact, was one of those outstanding prophecies quoted even in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 6. How could anyone have guessed 700 years in advance that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem? Or maybe even we might refer to Micah chapter 4 in which the prophet sounds very much like Isaiah 2 that the mountain of the Lord's house would be established in the top of the mountains and all nations would flow unto it. That the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. And we turn to Acts chapter 2 and we know the confirmation of that. Indeed, one of the great uh, privileges and advantages of studying the prophets is to say it is proof that the Bible is not the word of men but the Word of God. For Micah, nor any other man, could have guessed 700 years in advance these prophecies. And there's so many others that we find throughout the study of the prophets that I said is one of the strongest proofs that indeed the Bible, the Word of God, without contradiction among themselves, but also be able to say in advance, hundreds of years later, things that did come to pass. But also, while that is a fascinating point and study of the prophets, what really we need to understand is that they spoke to the people of their day. That their message, first of all, was a message that called men to turn to the Lord with your whole heart, to repent when there are indeed sins, to put away hypocrisy. And indeed, Micah was speaking at a time when there were those who who fulfilled or filled a, a kind of character that I just described that sometimes we think of our own time. It's interesting that the word Micah, literally, when translated from the Hebrew, means in the form of a question, who is like unto Jehovah? Is there anyone who really is righteous among us? Who is like Jehovah? Indeed, he, like other prophets, was calling men and women to repent. And so when we get to Micah chapter 6, we find probably one of the more famous passages from the book of Micah, preached many times, but only when you really understand its setting does it come to life fully, I think. Micah 6, I'm going to begin with verse 6. When the scripture says, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? 
Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearly calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, there are many who would like to simply ask that question, what does the Lord require? And then like a little list of do's and don'ts, and, and this sounds like it's that list. Three things to do justly, to love kindness or mercy, if you're reading the King James Version, and, and to walk humbly with thy God. But I want to suggest to you there's far more than three simple do's. It really encompasses an attitude that, that ought to characterize every servant of God. And I find, I find that as we study the prophets that, that when we see the conditions that in which they lived and the people to whom they spoke, it is so relevant to our own time. Micah may have lived 2,700 or 2,800 years ago, so to speak, and yet his message is alive today because, you see, we haven't changed that much. I hear people say, well, you know, we're not under the law of Moses anymore. Why study the Old Testament? But I think it is so rich and and so filling because we find that we are much like people of the past. I know we are physically, and we have a spirit within us that is an image of God. And though maybe God's law has changed, His character has not. He still demands righteousness in His people. He still demands sincerity. He does not want hypocrisy. He wants people who give Him their best. And therefore, we can learn from the prophets great and valuable lessons. You see, when you start even this chapter, you find out it's far more than, than just a few do's. For example, going back to verse 1 now, if you'll read with me, where he says, Hear now what the Lord is saying. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he will dispute. He has an indictment. The Lord has a complaint. He has a charge against his people because of their sin. And then look at the plea in verse 3. My people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and ransomed you from the house of slavery. I, I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. My people remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and from Shedem to Gilgal, so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. Can you hear the plea? And even today, if the Lord were to speak, even to those, many of those who claim to be his children, could he say, my people, how have I wearied you? Have you become weary? You may say, oh, I'm a Christian. Do you know anybody who says, I'm a Christian, but coming to a service like this is wearisome. It's a burden. It's almost, let's hurry up and get it over with. And maybe serving the Lord is, is something that they find rather difficult to do. Oh, they want to go to heaven, and they believe in God, and they believe this is the way to heaven. But really serving Him with a whole heart is, is not something they want to put their whole heart into. They've got other things going on. And so he says, how have I wearied you? Don't you remember what I've done for you? Don't you remember I brought you up from the land of Egypt? You were there in captivity and and in bondage and, and with Moses, I brought you out from slavery with Aaron and Miriam at his side. Or in verse 5, don't you remember what Balak, king of Moab, do you remember Balak hired Balaam to come and place a curse on God's people? And three times he went out instead of cursing each time he blessed. Don't you remember what I did in sparing you and leading you? Don't you remember even at the last camping ground before you crossed Jordan at Shedem and at the, and, and on the other side of Jordan, Gilgal, don't you remember how I was with you all the way? What have I done that has caused you to grow tired of serving me? And then it's out of that response that they ask verse 6, well, well what shall I come to the Lord about myself? What does the Lord want of me? You know, I'm his servant, aren't I offering sacrifices? 
And it's out of that that he says, well, here's what the Lord requires. You see what had happened with these people, of really much like seemingly the warning. You may recall, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, how in Deuteronomy chapter 8, even Moses had warned, when you, you know, when you get into the land, don't forget the Lord your God. Yes, there'll come a time where you'll prosper. There'll come a time when you've eaten and you're satisfied and you've built good houses and when your herds and your flocks multiply. In other words, when things go well and there's peace and there's prosperity, don't forget the Lord. But that's what had happened. Israel had become prosperous. They'd become so involved with the things of the here and now that, that they had forgotten that he had brought them out of slavery, out of Egypt. They'd forgotten the Lord. Could we say that in our peace and prosperity of this generation, we've gotten so busy with things, we get so, we've gotten so busy with the, with the here and now, that, that really we say we believe in the Lord, but we've sort of grown weary of giving Him our very best. You know, there are other things that are going on in our life, and they take preeminence and precedence over our action. Indeed, look back at chapter 3, and you get a little bit more of this indictment the Lord has against them. Micah 3, beginning in verse 1, he said, I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob and, and rulers of the house of Israel, I, is it not for you to know? Is it not for you to know uh, justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them and their flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them, break their bones and chop them up as for the pot as, and as meat in a kettle. You know, God's asked, how have I wearied you? And what's really happened is that even their very leaders, the civil leaders, the moral leaders, the religious leaders, have corrupted themselves. You, you notice here, it's almost like it's cannibalism. Now, it's not literal. And he says, you strip off the flesh from their bones and you eat the flesh of my people. But in a figurative way, you, you have so distorted justice. You, you've turned things around from what they really ought to be. In fact, where he says of them, you hate the good and love the evil. Verse 2, you, you tear off the skin from them. What do you mean you hate the good and, and love the evil? You reverse the order. Isaiah, who was contemporary, as I said, with, with Micah, probably a little bit older in age, but in Isaiah chapter 5 and verses 20 through 23, Isaiah said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and, and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and, and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and, and valiant men in mixing strong drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of the ones who are in the right. You get that? They turn just things around. The person who's really in the right says they take away their rights. A and they justify those who are wicked. If you have enough money for a bribe, they'll do that. Inter interesting that you could say they call the evil good. Have we come to a state like that? Have you ever begun to sort of feel like, what have we come to? We're living in a country now where where just even recently we've got, a, we've got a state that's now made legal same-sex marriages. And you think, can that be in this country that is in God we trust? Have we turned things around that now, you know, abortion, instead of being evil, it's good in the hearts and thoughts of many people. And we've twisted good and made it evil. We, we, we must not have prayer unto God in public places, you know. A and in fact, uh, we can't even have the Ten Commandments in a, in a justice hall. It has to be removed. We, we've come to a country where we've turned things around from good to evil and evil to good. Have we become weary of God? Have we come to a point where it could be said we are not a people like we once were? Indeed, if you understand that th that kind of feeling, you may understand what's really behind the time that Micah was prophesying. Oh, indeed, I think their times have changed. You'd probably agree with me. I, I found a poem that really came over the Internet, and I took it off of it. it. It was all it was said was written by a retired minister who lived in Tennessee, so I have no name to give you. But it goes like this. It titled, The Old Paths. He said, I like the old paths when moms were at home, dads were at work. 
Brothers went into the army, and sisters got married before having children. Crime did not pay, hard work did. And people knew the difference. Moms could cook, dads would work, children would behave. Husbands were loving, wives were supportive, and children were polite. Women wore the jewelry and men wore the pants. Women looked like ladies and men looked like gentlemen and children looked decent. People loved the truth and hated a lie. They came to church to get in, not to get out. Hymns sounded godly, sermons sounded helpful, rejoicing sounded normal, and crying sounded sincere. Cursing was wicked, drugs were for illness, and divorce was unthinkable. The flag was honored, America was beautiful, and God was welcome. We read the Bible in public, prayed in school, preached from house to house to be called an American was worth dying for. To be called a Christian was worth living for. To be called a traitor was a shame. Preachers preached because they had a message. And Christians rejoiced because they had the victory. Preachers preached from the Bible. Singers sang from the heart. And sinners turned to the Lord to be saved. A new birth meant a new life. Salvation meant a changed life. Following Christ led to eternal life. Being a preacher meant you proclaimed the Word of God. Being a deacon meant you would serve the Lord. Being a Christian meant you would live for Jesus. And being a sinner meant someone was praying for you. Laws were based on the Bible. Homes read the Bible and churches taught the Bible. God was worshipped. Christ was exalted, and the Holy Spirit was respected. Church was where you found Christians on the Lord's Day rather than in the garden, on the creek bank, on the golf course, or being entertained somewhere else. I still like the old paths the best. That rang a bell with me. I hope it does with you. In fact, you know, the times have changed, at least in my lifetime, and those who are my age or near can say, yes, you see a great difference. Maybe like even as the answer came, what does the Lord require? Maybe the first answer ought to be to do justly. We must remember to do what is equitable. First and foremost, what is fair among our fellow people, those about us. And you know this is taught clearly in the Scripture in various places. Places like Romans chapter 13, for example, in, in verses 7 through 9, the scripture there speaks how we ought to render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Oh, no, no, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there, be, if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. A tremendous passage when you stop and just break that down verse, uh, word or phrase by phrase. And, and indeed, what is justice but to treat others as Matthew 7 and verse 12, whatever you would do unto others, so as you would have them do unto you, so do unto them. And you find what a difference it'll make in your neighbor. What a difference it'll make even in your marriage, for that matter. I sometimes say that's a, such a great principle that what, what if in your marriage, if you ever have a problem, I say to people, what you need to do is, is, is sort of act. If you were a wife, what would you want to be married? Would you like to be married if your role was changed and you were a man? Would you want to be married to yourself, acting the way you act towards your husband? Or, or just the role reversed, you men? If you were a wife, would, would you want to be treated the way you're treating your wife? And you know that principle, to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, how it'll even help your marriage. It'll help you at your job. Do justly. Act equitably. Act as you want to be treated. You'll find what a great difference it'll make. Just because someone's poor, don't take advantage. And just because you may have wealth, don't even bribe to do that which is not righteous. 
But the second thing that he said was that we ought not only to do justly, but to love mercy. The King James Version says mercy. The New Americans that I've read, one, read from says to, to love kindness. And, and so in this passage, he's teaching a people who, who have failed to understand what real mercy or kindness is. You see, it's at a time where a bribe could win anything they wanted. Look again at Micah chapter 3, where in verses 9 through 11, he says, Now hear this, heads of the house of Jacob and, and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. Her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe, her priests instruct for a price. Her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord, saying, Is not the Lord in our midst? Calamity will not come upon us. Did you get that? Here are their leaders. They're very civil leaders here in, in their land. And yet, give them enough, they'll judge for reward. And, and, and not only their leaders, they're priests. Instruct for a price. Their prophets divine for money, and yet they lean on the Lord. We're righteous. We're God's people, aren't we? Look at back at verse 5. He said, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, when they have something to bite with their teeth, they cry peace. But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. <laughs> You know, as long as you feed them, they, boy, they'll say it like you like it. And if they don't like what you say, they'll declare war against you. You don't pay them enough. I'll tell you, preachers today in our country sometimes are not really respected that much. I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I'm meeting for the very first time. I almost hate to say I'm a preacher because that just almost pulls the curtain down. Not long ago, I was on the plane. Arlene was with me, and I was in the middle seat. You know, she's by the window. I'm in the middle, men on my right at the aisle, and we got to talking a little bit. You know, what, did, what work does he do? And he asked me, he said, well, what do you do? I said, I'm in insurance. He said, oh, really? You know, you know, yeah. And I said, fire insurance. <laughs> and then I went on to tell him, you know, I'm a gospel preacher trying to help you from going to a place where there's eternal fire. And, and, and let me add to that, not only just, you know, I have to try to lead into this in a way that, that let him know I'm just a human being, but I really hold back from telling anybody, you know, we've got a TV program in Orlando and I'm speaking on it. Why? Because how many TV preachers do you think of hands out like that, right? Send in your vow, send in your money, and then we hear so many stories that we've gotten things that we think, look at this passage. Is this not relevant to our day? There are those who do make godliness a way of gain. But that's not righteous in God's sight. Greed and avarice rule their actions. In Isaiah chapter 56, again, the prophet Isaiah said, They are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each one to his unjust gain, to the last one. Well, in fact, it is God loved them but would not bless them. I put it that way because I want you to understand the comeback today so often is, don't you know, God is love and he just loves us and it hardly matters what we do. Somehow, someway, everybody's going to be saved. At least that's sort of the thinking that permeated the kind of preaching that's done from so many pulpits. If you look at verse 12 of chapter 3, if you're still open there, where Micah says, therefore, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins. And the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. Indeed, the prophet spoke of their sin, and God would bring condemnation on them. And if you know your Bible history, you know that they were brought into captivity. God not only, first of all, brought down the northern ten tribes in 722, but he later brought down even Judah, and the temple itself was destroyed because of their hypocrisy, their failure to love God and truly from the heart to serve him. They lean on the Lord, but they weren't really true servants of the Lord God. I tell you, our nation too will fall today if we do not learn to really practice righteousness. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34, 
that uh, uh, godliness, righteousness exalts a nation, but iniquity is a disgrace to any people. Indeed, we are going to stand so long as we're righteous. We must remember to love mercy. Our God is the God of mercy. He has provided for us forgiveness of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, and it is undeserving on our part. And therefore, even as we deal with other people and as we love God, we need to remember to love, and to love in a way that even God loves. And, and that's illustrated in many passages of the Bible. I've, I've thrown up at least a couple here. You know probably best in Luke chapter 10 there, the, the story we hear about the Good Samaritan. He loved mercy. And he illustrated, really, Jesus was teaching, who's my neighbor? You know, the man that was overtaken by robbers, and he was beaten and left for dead. And along came the priest, went by on the other side. Along came the Levite, went by on the other side. But there was this Samaritan, a half-breed, as we would describe sometimes. And yet he, he was looked down upon by the Jews, by the religious people, the real servants of God at least so claimed. But it was this Samaritan that stopped and, and took care of his wounds and, and took him back into the city to the inn and, and even paid for his way and, and left extra money and said, look, now even when I come back, if there's been more, I'll, take, I'll pay you for him. I'll take care of him. He didn't know him. But there was a sense of mercy. It wasn't because the man had done something deserving this. And not any of us have done anything to deserve God's mercy upon us. But we need to treat others as, as God would want us to treat, as he has treated us. And, and you know, along with that, the other passage is not just showing kindness in the sense of a physical caring. But Matthew 6 and verse 12 is the passage that, that teaches us to forgive one another. If we're not willing to forgive, neither would God forgive us. And in Matthew 18, he teaches the parable about about the man who owed a great debt. And he begged the one to whom he owed the great debt to please forgive him. And he did. But he goes out to a fellow servant who owes him really a, a very small debt, and he will not forgive that small debt. And therefore, when the first man hears about him, he begins to require the payment that he had originally forgiven. What that illustrates, it, it's like God here with him, every one of us owes a great debt. And if we're going to be forgiven of our great debt, can we not forgive one another? How many times have you heard of churches of the Lord, supposedly, having division? And we understand, you know, we say, well, you know, what's caused? Well, what was the cause of that? Well, you know, personality problems, personality problems. Some time ago, I was asked by a good brother, what I thought was the greatest problem among the Lord's church today. and He thought I was going to give some doctrinal question. And, and really, uh, uh, we, we always are having to deal with different questions that arise, and it's righteous for us to deal and talk about the Word of God and to grow in knowledge as we do. But I did not try to state some doctrinal issue. I said, I think the real problem among the Lord's people today is selfishness. Our society is often called the me generation. And if we're not careful, we get into acting just like the world around us, when instead we ought to be men and women who practice brotherly love. And recognizing that, that we forgive one another even as we want God to forgive us. Is anybody you hold on against that you've not really worked out and made right with them? I was in a congregation some time ago in another state, really, and it was along about Wednesday night that I was told there were two men in the congregation. I'd, I'd already met them. One sitting up near the front, the other sitting near the back. And they'd have both been called on leading prayer. But they wouldn't speak to each other. They'd had a squabble in the family type of squabble. And they'd sort of wait till one got out. And I, after that, I began to watch them, you know. They'd, they'd make sure that they wouldn't have to cross each other. So therefore, they, you know, they just wouldn't really openly not speak a marvel that they even were called on lead prayer because I do not believe their, the sound of their voice got any higher than the ceiling of that building. If we're not willing to forgive one another, to love mercy, God the Father of mercy. It's more than just a little simple do, you see, to do justly. 
to love mercy, and then to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly with God means really to obey Him. It isn't just outward show. I, I commend you for coming tonight. I commend some who've been here every service for that matter, but and, and, and I'm thankful for it. Don't misunderstand my point. But I'm troubled by what appears with some people as though, well, I've gotten here and that's the main thing. It, it's do I have to come. And that's the wrong attitude. Outward show of itself is not sufficient to please the Lord. It must come from the heart. Look again at Micah chapter 6. Did you notice the passage? When they asked the question, verse 6, well, what shall I come to the, to, to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I, shall I come to him with, with burnt offerings? What shall I bring? Uh, does, with yearling calves? Now, does God delight in calves, a year old? I mean, these are what under the law of Moses, without spot, without blemish, even maybe the first things of the flock, but not just calves for animal sacrifice. How about a multitude of them? How about thousands of rams? Or 10,000 rivers of oil? Or more than that, shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You know, that's kind of like, Lord, look here, I give, you, I give you this outward. In fact, I'll even go to the extreme. I'll go beyond what you commanded. God had forbidden giving human sacrifice, but they were even willing to give their firstborn. And boy, that's really to the extreme, isn't it? Look, Lord, I'll just do it. But he's saying, no, no, you've missed the point. What does God want? What God wants is you, not just yours. God hates outward show. And if your religion is just because, well, my, you know, my mother and dad were Christians, and that's why I remember the church. My granddad was a gospel preacher. And that's why I come. That's the wrong motive. And if all you're doing is sort of marking the, the calendar to sort of say, you know, I'm, in, I'm doing the outward show, you've missed it. Indeed, to serve the Lord, he wants you, not just yours. Again, since Isaiah and Micah are contemporary, I'll ask you if you've got a Bible, look up back at Isaiah chapter 1. I'll tell you, the passage in Isaiah 1, verses 6 through 10 is, is pretty hard saying. But I sometimes wonder if, if God would say that to some people today who call themselves Christians. Would he write something like this by his prophet today? Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in, in, in verse 11, reading through verse 15. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my corpse? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer... I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Or really, your hands are covered with sin, is the idea. In other words, there's hypocrisy here. How many today preach a message that, well, you know, it really matters what we do and how we do it? There are those who say, well, God is love and God loves us. He's full of grace and it's like it doesn't matter. But you look at passages like of the past, God hasn't changed. His law may have changed, but he still hates hypocrisy. And if you're not worshiping him from the heart, if your obedience is not from a humble walk, then God could say, I hate what you're doing. I will not listen to your prayers. That's serious, isn't it? Tomorrow night we're going to preach to Malachi, but you might jot this down if you're writing, uh, writing notes that in, in, Micah, in Malachi chapter 1, where he says, look, you bring the lame, the blind, the sick, and I just wish someone would shut the doors. I wonder sometimes how startled some would be who, who be, I've been a member of the church for years. And if maybe there's an angel in the appearance of a man stopping at the door and saying, no, 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 God doesn't want you here today. Shut the door. 
And then, oh, me? But that's what Malachi is saying. There's some people who call themselves his people that say, shut the doors. Why? Because they're just giving God the second best. They're giving him the leftovers. And he doesn't want the leftovers. God wants you, not just yours. In Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17, I think one of the more beautiful passages of the Old Testament that really explains what God truly wants. It's the prayer of David. Probably thought of, uh, spoken as at the time shortly after he'd committed the grievous sin of Bathsheba. And his words were like this, you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You're not pleased with burnt offering. Now, to say that, if that's the only verse you had, you think, well, David, you've missed it. Don't you know the law of Moses commanded burnt offerings and sacrifices? Yes. But look at the next rest of that. He said, you don't want just the outward. He says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. God wants sincerity, a broken heart. You know, in Matthew 15, even Jesus spoke about some who were hypocrites who drew nigh with their mouth, honored him with their lips, but their heart was far from him. In vain, he said, you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Indeed, we must walk humbly, meaning we do God's will in God's way. Jesus is our example of that. How it was that, in fact, of Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, emptied himself. He was one who took upon him the the form of a servant made, made in likeness of man became obedient even to death, even the death of the cross. We're to be like him. We're to obey the Lord, obey the Lord even from the heart. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things he suffered. And likewise, in following him, our obedience must be from the heart. And you know, to even talk about what do we do to become a Christian, I tell you, if, if baptism... We're just an outward act, and there's some who say, oh, you just believe we're saved by the water of baptism. No, I don't. I believe we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we reach it in the act of baptism. If it were just water only, you know what I'd do? I'd get the strongest men I could find in, in, in every person I could. I'd, if I had to tie them, get these men, drag them down, we'd dip them in water. But that won't save them. Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4 says, don't you know? Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? That's where we reach the blood, you see. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should rise to walk in newness of life. And baptism is the means by which we reach the blood of Christ, and that's the means we're saved. But then later in that same chapter, and here's what I want you to see, verses 17 and 18. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 17, God be thanked that though you were the servants of sin, you became obedient from the heart. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you, being then made free from sin. It has to be an act of faith. It has to come from the heart, or it'll do no good. Indeed, baptism is but the answer of a good conscience toward God, 1 Peter 3, 21. And that's why it says, it doth also now save us. It isn't just the washing away of the flesh, of the dirt from the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. And all we do, not only in obeying Him, but even as we worship on the Lord's Day, the Lord's Supper. It does no good if you go through the right form if you're not discerning the Lord's body and His blood. In fact, 1 Corinthians 11 says, you eat and drink damnation to your soul. It was just a mere act without discerning his body and blood. What do we say? What God wants of us is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And that comprehends our whole attitude in loving God, serving him, living among others in the righteous way, displaying even and practicing the love of God toward one another, but most of all toward God, saying, Lord, thy will be done. I'll keep your will the best I can. Am I talking to someone tonight who would say, if God looked at you tonight, he would say, I I I'll hide my eyes from you. You've been a hypocrite. If that be true, then why not tonight turn your heart in true repentance, confessing your faults. We'll pray with you and pray for you. God promised to forgive those who sincerely respond. Maybe there's one here tonight who's never obeyed the gospel of Christ, being immersed into the death of Christ, and yet you do believe from the heart. Why not then obey from the heart? As a true believer, 
yield your life unto him. Jesus is tenderly calling thee home, calling today. Why? From the sunshine of love will you roam farther and farther away. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we bid you come tonight, even now, as together we stand and while we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling you Appreciate the fine lesson, and we appreciate your cooperation in singing praises to God with me. We're going to uh, sing number 518 in closing, walk, Stepping in the Light, How Beautiful to Walk in the Steps of the Savior. I want to announce also that tomorrow evening I have been meeting with some men here each evening, either before service or after service. It started Sunday. Uh, Adam and Jared and Britton, and also, is it Jeremiah? Is that right? Well, I got, I got the wrong, okay. That's who, anyway, it's John's boy. <laughs> he's been coming, and he's got a lot of ability. He's gonna make a good one. But anyway, tomorrow night, before 7 o'clock, we'd like for you to be here at 6.45 if you can, those of you that can be here. These men are going to lead us in a song of peace. And we just want to try to let them have that experience. And if you'll be here, it will help them to encourage them, I'm sure, in song leading. But we plan on doing that tomorrow night. We're going to meet tonight after services again. And then we'll meet again tomorrow evening at 6. And I just have thoroughly enjoyed working with them from Sunday through, Lord willing, tomorrow night, Thursday. Let's turn now to 518, and then we'll have our closing prayer, and then be dismissed.
our most gracious Father who art in heaven. We come to thee, Father, at the close of this service, realizing indeed how beautiful it is that we have the privilege to walk in the steps of our dear Savior. We pray, Father, that you will help all of us to daily question what you would require of us. But not only, Father, that we would question, but that we would act. Give us the wisdom that we need after we have studied from thy word to be able to do the things which you would have us to do daily. Help us, Father, always to be of an attitude, here am I, send me. We pray, Father, if there be those in the audience this evening who have heard thy word and have not acted, have not responded, that they would respond to thy call before it is everlastingly too late. Be with those of this number and of thy children uh, in all places that are bereaved and ill and are going through bad times. Comfort them, give them the strength that they need. Help them, Father, to realize that through thy word and through thee, they are truly blessed, as are all of us. And we ask now, Father, that you would be with Brother Harkrider, Brother Stevens, and with their families. We pray especially for our Brother Tim Stevens, who is in the hospital. We pray, Father, that you would continue to be with him that you would be with our sister Valicia as her father undergoes surgery. May the things that are done be those things that are needful and he might return to his health, that his life might be spared and he might be able to learn of the gospel and turn to thee. We're so thankful, Father, for this time. And we ask now that you would bless us as we close this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.